What is up everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from the altar again and this time we got round two or round three technically with Gene Hoagland of Death Clock, Dark Angel and of course we are going to talk about death to all. Thanks for coming back on the show today. Right on, Alex. Appreciate it, man. Happy to be here. Thanks for thanks for having me. Totally. Anytime, man. Anytime. So uh, the last time I spoke to you, we kind of focused a lot more on Dark Angel as well as sort of like a retrospective on all the projects you've been involved with. But now we're uh, getting death to all. First off, to hear, you know, individual thought patterns in its entirety uh, back in, uh, a couple years ago was truly a magical experience. But now we're getting some of the later materials such as the Sound of Perseverance and whatnot. I mean, just playing this material in general, how different of an attachment would you say it is compared to the stuff that you've done with Dark Angel or Testament or Strapping Young Lad? Is there almost kind of different energy that's channeled into this? Well, I, I suppose so because, like, say you got you when you have an album like Individual Thought Patterns or Symbolic or anything that we we you know focused on or, or intend to focus on. Um, that is you know you, you've got the personal stamp of it being kind of your material so you get to really take a lot of you can take a lot of liberties with your own stuff if you like you know but when you're playing like say something like like you know the sound of perseverance richard christie on drums you know i want to tr i want to um you know pay pay tribute to richard as well and try to mimic his parts as best as i can um as best as any other human being can with Richard's crazy mind of drumming. So uh, we'll try to put that to, to work. And so that's that's one thing, that's the kind of energy you bring where it's like, if you're gonna cover, you know, the Sound of Perseverance, very iconic drum album for a lot of guys. Um, so if you're gonna try to cover material off, off from a certain player, you wanna try to try to get as close as you can like if you're gonna if you're gonna cover a rush song you try to nail as much neil peart as you can you know you try to get as close to the close to the original as you can and that's what that's what i'm going to be trying to do with the, the sound of perseverance and stuff and um with with scream bloody gore that's that poses its own challenges because that was a very young death and you try to you try to capture that energy and that kind of very primal, rather, rather like kind of caveman sort of style, as opposed to some of the later stuff. You know, it, it's it's pretty visceral and pretty brutal and, and much more simple than the the latter era stuff. But that's equally as important. You know, you want to try to, to capture that that sort of energy from that album. You know, well, God, as a matter of fact texting with Randy Burns today, you know, the producer of that album, producer of Darkness Descends, he's going to be coming out to a Death Clock show, just as I'm talking about Screen Bloody Car. I was like, oh, that's right, Randy Burns sent a text today. So that's pretty fun. Yeah. Well, I mean, because Scream Bloody Gore does have what I call like the debut charm behind it. It has that sort of underground innocence, the sort of rawness that a lot of great debut albums have. With The Sound of Perseverance, you know, it's the final death album and what a final album to, you know, end a fantastic discography on. And, but like you, you notice a lot of differences in it. And when you mentioned the drumming too, cause you know, Richard Christie coming on for the Sound of Perseverance, but I know that you were on Symbolic and uh, Individual and, and fairly a couple of other uh, awesome albums. So would you say, because Death was a very experimental band with the classical death metal elements, but the progressive and technical elements, did almost every single album call for its own technical approach in a way? Um. I would say so in terms of like once when when Sean Reiner laid the template down for what you can do with with the drums in in a band like Death and you know you had other bands like Atheist and and, and Watchtower of course we were all huge gigantic Watchtower fans so was Chuck and I think that's when 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 Sean brought that approach to Death Chuck was such a Watchtower fan that I think Chuck was like, I'm okay with this, you know, melding some some visceral death metal with some chops, you know, like Rick Cola Luca from Watchtower. Um, you know, I think that's where Chuck was like, this is cool, I'm okay with this. So when Sean said that template, that's the first thing I asked Chuck when we started working on, on individual thought patterns is like, 
what kind of approach do you want me to take on this? I mean, can I do something like Sean? Because I'm, I'm raring to go with that. I'm, I'm excited to do that. If, if that's the case, and Chuck, and Chuck was like, go sick, go nuts, do do your thing, and I'll I'll play along, and I'll let you know if, 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 if it's not working. And so all the patterns that I came up with were individual thought patterns. Chuck, you know, gave the thumbs up too. So, so that was pretty good. And um, there, each album, obviously from Death, has its own separate charm than than all the others. You know, Scream, Bloody Gore, all the way to, to the Sound of Perseverance. Each one had its own flavor. Each one had its own sort of approach. But the one thing that kind of tied it all together of course is the man himself Chuck Schuldiner so uh, that was the it was any era there, there, there are no bad eras of death you know and so that's that's one of the few few bands where you know you, you, you can't fault a lot of what death did you know I mean and I understand we were there when it was going down when 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 death kind of went melodic or, you know, experimental, whatever you want to call it. Um, a lot of the old hardcores, you know, they were like, hey man, what happened to my my favorite death metal band? You know, what what the hell's going on with you guys? What are you guys thinking? It was not universally accepted in, in like an album like Symbolic. It sure did not ever appear like this one was going to become a classic or, or a, a a revered album 30 whatever years later um so i mean go go figure you know but a lot of folks seem to enjoy it but at the time i'm not saying we we're getting hatred but we got a lot of hate for putting well, out symbolic what know? i what i love about death is because you know i was a total late bloomer with death you know i was Fair much enough. older when you know i was discovering this material but i feel like death is one of those bands where every album has like every fan has if i speak to a death fan almost nine times out of ten they're going to tell me a different uh album is their favorite i've heard just right. as many people tell me human is their favorite sound of perseverance symbolic yeah, yeah it's in it, i think that is speaks to really just how technically impressive death always was because i feel like they were a band that could experiment so much while being labeled a death metal band and still make it good like Let's say Cannibal Corpse all of a sudden started writing like a ten and a half minute long song with a very soft solo in it and maybe some melodic singing thrown in there. I mean, I'm open to checking out some cool stuff like that, but it might take a lot of people by surprise. I felt like with the experimental turns that Death always did, it didn't really surprise people when you would go from Scream Bloody Gore onwards, you know. Well, that's the yeah, absolutely, you know, and, and it the the one thing about Chuck was you know he he wrote for himself. You know, we've all worked with guys that work that write for what they think their audience wants. And Chuck, you know, he was like, "This is this is what I have to do. This is what's you know." That's why an album, you know, like Sound of Perseverance, does not sound like Scream Bloody Gore. You know, he he had to evolve himself, and and that's where you know, kudos to Chuck. He was he was not afraid to say, "Look, this is regardless of what the band." is called this is me and my music and i'm i'm i need to represent myself you know i have to look myself in the in the mirror every morning and if i'm going to try something that was great in 1987 for for me and now it's 1995 it's i'm not the same person i was eight years ago so it, it stands to reason that the music would not remain the same either and that's that would be the big sellout you know if you're just like oh, i'm not i'm not that person anymore but i'm going to keep recycling that style just because that's what people want to hear chuck never did that and so you know more power to chuck and his memory for for, for not doing that and you know that I, I i've mentioned this before it's like granted you know, Chuck was was never comfortable ever being called the godfather of death metal because he's like, I, I I didn't invent this. You know, um, you know, I 
I love possessed. You know, look at possessed. Possessed created the term death metal. You know, so Chuck always, you know, gave yeah, Chuck and, and Jeff Becerra and those possessed guys were all friends. Um, and Chuck always gave Jeff, you know, the credit that Jeff obviously deserved as the lyricist and vocalist of. I mean, you, you hear the similarities between Mr. Becerra and Mr. Schuldiner, but um, when Chuck decided to enter a new phase of his, you know, writing and his career, you know, it's one thing to help create a style of music. You know, I mean, it, it, it's one thing if you're a band that, and, and this is what I've said before, if you're a band that is playing an established style of music and you do it well and you get popular and people like your band great you know you're not reinventing the wheel by any means but you're you know you're you're doing something that is very popular and people enjoy your music fantastic but it's another thing to be on the ground floor of a style and help create and and shape that style which death did with death metal obviously scream bloody gore all of that doing it with mantis you know two three years before you know they changed to death so i mean chuck was on the ground floor of a lot of this stuff then when human came out and the the more technical aspect of 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 music and of metal was coming out chuck was one of the progenitors of that death was one of the progenitors of that you know like i said atheist Watchtower, Mekong Delta, you know, cynic bands on the technical level. There wasn't a cynic, you know, too much. They were still a demo band at that moment. Oh, really? Um, they, they hadn't released, um, you know, when when they did Human, uh, Cynic hadn't released an album yet. Um, they were in the demo phase and they weren't quite where they were at when um, for Focus. But you know, being a part of that sort of technical area being one of the one of one of the early designs of that style one designers of that style that's you know that's that is a uh, you know a secondary style of music creating then around the time of individual and symbolic the melodic death metal which wasn't really a thing at all you know people were tripping balls on on individual thought patterns like, oh, this is really melodic you know this is this is strange and then even so with with symbolic but you have bands like carcass with heartwork and you know the early opeth material that was relatively melodic but there wasn't a melodic death metal sort of thing so being a part of three different musical styles within a very short span of time it's not like that it went on for 30 years death's output was from 87 to 98 so you know just in an 11 year span doing what death did that that's pretty exciting you know that, that's that's pretty amazing actually so that's pretty awesome because i've heard so many like think about it like this we've seen plenty of great drummers in the world of death metal play with other death metal bands right you'll see you know a member play with cannibal corpse and deicide and then go to six feet under you've seen many band metal chord you'll maybe see like the as la dying drummer play with a kill switch engage or an unearth or something like that so like you see a lot of bands, but you were able to switch genres you were able to play on different types of albums like i said i feel like when it comes to concept albums that was something you were always being able to uh, familiarize yourself with whether it was the fear factory record or the death stuff or the dark angel stuff but uh one thing i wanted to mention too about this is because i was uh talking with Maurizio of cataclysm earlier today and uh we were talking about like death metal and a lot of newer bands you see a lot of like new death metal bands like frozen soul or sang with sugabog taking a lot of inspiration from the cannibal corpses and the morbid angels and the deicides but where did a lot of the influences come from those bands as well as, you know, Death, because they didn't exactly have, sure, you had Possessed at the time, but they were kind of like s similar ages in a way. And I feel like those bands weren't as exposed uh, to a lot of young metalheads without the internet at that time, at least and stuff, you know? Indeed, absolutely, you know, and it it's kind of surprising. I've talked to a lot of a lot of the metalcore guys, you know, I remember Travis from Atreyu, um, 
came up to me one time. We were on tour with them. I was in strapping. I think we were doing a uh, like a, a Ozfest or something. And uh, you know, he had mentioned that you know I cut my teeth playing guitar on for with Symbolic. I mean that that's that's my jam, you know, Symbolic. And I was like, wow, crazy. You play a, a tribute. I wouldn't have ever put this together, but you know, it, it's strange. Like I remember Dave, and I mentioned this before, Dave from some 41 you know brown sound from some 41 he, i remember he sought me out at a show and said symbolic is what i learned how to play guitar to kind of thing so it's like wow just the the far reaching tendrils of what of death's influence and maybe that was due to some of the melodicness of it it wasn't just like mm, mm, where it's just like okay we get what this band could do intense brutal the heavy stuff these guys were great i mean death was you know had kind of a a universal approach i suppose i never really even thought about that until now but you know being not the same band that they were in their screen bloody gore and leprosy and and, and um spiritual healing phase being not the, you know not being that same band might have opened up a few just you know, opened up a few minds and a few avenues for for creating their legacy. You know, perhaps you right. know, and there wasn't anything Chuck ever like concentrated on. He's like, I I write music. You know, I write what I want to hear. I write what I I write what I know, and you know, and that's one thing that is relatively constant between every death album is. Sure, the riffs started getting a little more melodic, a little more musical, and, and a little more on the technical side. But I think it was like a lot of times it was it was the musicians that Chuck surrounded himself with um, that helped propel, you know, death to, to the influence that they ended up having, you know. And, um, you know, because I, I, I remember Chuck playing me some of the material, some of the human material, that he had with the, with his um, spiritual healing guys, you know, Terry and, and Billy. And it was quite a bit different than what Sean, Sean brought to it. You know, Paul played leads, of course, he wasn't writing any of the riffs, but, um, you know, like what Sean brought to it, you know, just really elevated it to this really, you know, exciting music. I mean, Human was an exciting album. And I think that was the perfect um, transition for for death for Chuck, because um, you know uh, spiritual healing was starting to uh, you know that was a very very popular album and to this day it's a popular album. But you can kind of see the uh, the fact that a change came on the next album was kind of a welcome welcome surprise you know welcome a welcome approach you know because human was god god dang that thing's a magical record i tell you that's my favorite death album flat out so well i think chuck really did prove that it's cool to experiment and to go outside of a comfort zone and to not be vigilant i think he almost kind of demonstrated in a way uh, and I'm not going to give him all the credit, but I think it was he did demonstrate the way that you can push boundaries and experiment. And this is what led me to my next question, because again, I sadly not never got to experience watching Chuck. You know, I was sadly I was only seven years old when we sadly lost Chuck, and uh, I never got to I never got to you know what you know see too many interviews with him and you know experience that. I just wanted to know because you have your own creative intensity as well and your own technical proficiency and joining forces with him and working with him, writing with him and playing with him. I mean, just kind of like, what was it like working with somebody like him? Because I've heard everything from he was a mad scientist in the studio to he was also one of the most hilarious people you would see in, in metal as well. I just heard so many great things about him. And like just, But as a creator, what was the sort of emotional connection that you would share with him and all that? That's a really good question. Um, well, one thing, like, for instance, the way that we put together individual thought patterns was, you know, when when Chuck and I had spent a phone conversation, you know, talking about like, you know, do we want to do we want to do this together? 
And, you know, we decided, yeah, let's give this thing a shot. You know, because we, we'd known each other for, for many years before, before I went to Florida and, and started working on individual. And Chuck had mentioned to me, I have this riff tape. Um, I'll send you the riff tape. Here's the idea of the songs. It's just me and a guitar, you know, two tracks of guitar. There's no, there's, there's no drum programming on it or anything. So do with it what you can. And, you know, I was thinking in the, you know, you had, you had to put that thing in the mail, you know, the cassette, a cassette in the mail. It's not like you had, you know, I'm going to send you over some files and check them out and get back to me in two hours and tell me what you think. You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And yeah, so uh, it was snail mail. So I was, you know, spending the next couple of days waiting to, waiting to get this tape in the mail. And I was thinking, man, this could be like kind of the meeting of the minds, you know, like, you know, Chuck's death, you know, human was the last record that they put out. I was like, that is a vicious album. Me, I'm no stranger to viciousness myself. So, you know, having both of us, you know, come together doing this, we, we, there's a good possibility we're about to create this like brutal death metal masterpiece. And then when I heard the material, I heard the, the cassette, I was, it was, I was, very very surprised with the melodic nature of it you know and i was like oh this is this is you know not what i was expecting it, but it was all really really good but the one thing i do recall was that on that tape a lot of the riffs were up in the higher positions of the you know you know e on the a string seventh position kind of thing like a lot of stuff way up there so i you know i'm I remember when when I landed in Florida and we were on the way to, to Chuck's pad. I was like, "Tell you what, Chuck, um, can can we sit down with a, with a couple of guitars and you just teach me all your material, and that's going to help me kind of get accents for drums, you know, because I, I can hear what you're doing on the thing, but if I know how to play it, then that's really going to help me lock in some drums because I really wanted to do a lot of." direct locking in with what Chuck was doing. And he's like, yeah, sure, no, no problem. And so while we're jamming out the riffs and a lot of the stuff is way up here, um, you know, I had mentioned to Chuck on a, on a number of occasions, like, hey, have you ever thought about like, you know, this riff that's way up here? You never thought about maybe going down here on the neck with it, you know, making it kind of heavy. And he was like, I, I never thought of that. Great idea. I like, I like that. So let's, that's the new riff in the song, you know? So just trans transposing things from super high to just low where you get a little little chunk on there kind of thing so we did that on a number on a number of the songs and it it was still melodic but it wasn't you know it it, it also started adding a flavor of like you know heaviness that was surprisingly not as present you know, until we started transposing some stuff down low. Um, and so that, I, you know, I hope that helped, helped the material, you know, uh, so, so that's pretty good. Definitely. But, um, we, and that was the thing, you know, every, I'd, I'd come back to Chuck, you know, as we're jamming, you know, we, we put individual together in about three weeks or so. And we hit the studio pretty immediately. And, from time to time during the, the rehearsals, you know, I would I would stop and say, hey, Chuck, is, you know, all these parts I'm playing, are, you know, are they working for you? He's like, yeah, man, you know, I, I can play all my riffs over what you're playing. I'm locking in with what you're doing. I'm, I'm catching what you're doing. So you just keep doing, doing what you're doing, and I'm cool with it. And I remember on individual and on symbolic, there were only two drum patterns that I had come up with that uh, – I remember Scott Burns. It was the beginning of a song called uh, Jealousy. And uh, I remember Scott in the studio kind of going, well, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not feeling that, that, that intro rip that you've come up with. Can you come up with something right here on the, on the fly? And I was like, sure, you know, there you go. And so one beat on individual got changed. And then one beat on symbolic, exact same thing. You know, we're, we're 
Jim Morris was kind of like, oh, I'm not kind of, I'm not sure what you're trying to do there. So can we just do something that you know is very cohesive? Yeah, sure, no problem. And but Chuck was like, dude, all that whacked out weirdo stuff, I'm I'm playing right over it. So keep doing your thing, man. Totally. I want to thank you so much for telling me all this, just because as you know, as somebody who when I was very much getting into death metal and you know I would listen to these death albums and then you know look up seeing you know why death doesn't play anymore and you know never got to experience that I never would have thought a young death metal fan I would have the opportunity to be able to hear these amazing stories so I want to thank you uh, for that and <laughs> thank you, you Alex yep, and you led me perfectly into the final question I wanted to ask you if you got time for one more and, and we brushed oh, upon sure. it a little bit but from being involved to West Coast Bay Area thrash metal, to being involved in Tampa, Florida death metal, to work behind creative geniuses, visionaries between Chuck Schuldner, Brendan Small, Devin Townsend. You've been able to cross many different movements, many different genres. Not to discredit like other fantastic drum legends, but I feel like, for instance, like Lars Ulrich is always going to be tied to Bay Area thrash metal. You know what I mean? You're going to have, you know, drumming legends who, you know, are kind of associated with just that. But I feel like you have been able to make your footprint and make your rhythm echo through many different styles of metal. And forgive me if this question is too long. But, like, experiencing all these different movements, working with all of these different masterminds, and really just developing a signature drumming style of your own, have you just found multiple ways of just expressing yourself? Like, do you feel like you really, with every project, you put yourself in other people, in other shoes, or maybe other pedals in this case, or something like that? Do you feel like <laughs> maybe Gene Hoagland is almost kind of like a different beast depending on what era or movement you are involved in or what style you play? 100%, that is exactly my, my approach is like, for me to be a chameleon is and be able to meld myself to whatever that person's vision is that person's vision that person's vision and try to make it so it's you know there, there's going to be some signature things i suppose from from one musician doing doing all these different parts there are going to there will be some cross collateralization of things but i really i i really try to being a chameleon for for each genre and you know like even some of the you know obviously like with with dev you know there's psychotic strapping on land and then there's very mild straightforward kind of teria kind of things and so just to be for me to be a a, a chameleon to be a well-rounded drummer that's what i've always wanted to be that's way more important than being the fastest or having the fastest blast beat or the fastest beat, that's, that means nothing to, to, to me. But if somebody can say, you know, okay, did you hear that psycho tune? Like, I don't know, you know, Shitstorm or Skeksis or something from Strapping or, or some Death Pop song. But then did you hear that guy funk on whatever that, you know, like that middle part of Anti Product by by strapping, you know, I'll bring that song up because I heard it for the first time in a long time the other day. Got pretty little funky little part shuffles and stuff. Or, or you know, and a lot of the crazy drum things I've done, nobody's ever really heard because a lot of the whacked out drum parts I've come up with and recorded, a lot of these albums aren't very well known, and sometimes people don't really dig too deep on things, so you miss out. You know, there, there's giant sections of what I'm able to do that don't really capture a uh, an audience you know so um you know so just trying to be a very well-rounded drummer that's way more important to me like being able to do this style that style this style that style and try to be convincing at all of them um that that's important to me i i i, I like that and you know to to be a creative mind and and be able to like with albums like individual thought patterns or or symbolic or you know some strapping stuff or anything where you try to create beats that have never been heard before that's super cool for me that was what i was trying to do with individual thought patterns you know it's like you know there's there's times when it's like wow that that beat has never been you know played before it's like cool you know that kind of thing so introducing like the bem baby the brazilian bem baby which i caught from steve 
Steve Gadd from the Aldiniola era of Steve Gadd, but that was something that's all over the individual thought patterns record where I'm like, I, I don't think I've ever heard this beat in a in a metal song before. So I threw it all over individual thought patterns, and that's right out of the song Casino by Al Di Miola with with Steve Gadd on drums. But trying to pull those influences, you know, let your Neil Peart influence show, let your Dean Castronovo influence show, let all these all these great players, and that's where it, you know, because I'm. I'm as a drummer. I'm as much of a thief as anybody else out there. But the one thing that I try to have a little bit of, like, I don't know, integrity or something, is um, if you're going to steal and you're going to take and and flat out cop somebody else's lick, then you better put something into that pot as well. You better put a lot in for every lick that you steal. You better put two in that no, you know that. You know, you, you better you better pay into the well kind of thing. So that's what I've always tried to do is just you know try to come up with stuff that approaches that maybe people haven't heard. And um, you know, so that's one thing I always tried to be always always try to be original. I never wanted to sound too much like anybody else. That's why I'm very happy to say this lick here. I stole it from this guy. This lick here, stole it from that guy. You know. Uh, the chorus to symbolic direct robbery from from Dean Castronova, you know that kind of thing, and so that's why I, I do feel like I've, I've put in enough, you know, brand new, fresh kind of ideas that uh, that I can flat out say I robbed from this guy and I robbed from that guy directly, you know. So there you go. Yeah, and uh, you know, like. You, I've always said because you know I've always been impressed by your record of concept albums and stuff. I've always said you are the thinking man's drummer. You're the madman's drummer. You're the <laughs> warrior's drummer. I feel like you are the drummer for many different. The many. I feel like you are a reflection of the many different thoughts. Maybe the individual thought patterns, pun somewhat intended, <laughs> of that many metalheads do experience again. Again, I've never. You know, obviously for the sake of this video, I had to introduce you as Gene Hogan from Death to All. But I've never thought of you as Gene Hoagland from Testament or Gene Hoagland from Dark Angel or Gene Hoagland. Like, right. I've just thought of you as Gene Hoagland in a way. So Thank you. That's what I do try to, you know, I do try to, well, I guess, you know, try to transcend any band that I've been with, you know, by, you know, kind of, yeah, a lot of times, you know, you know that's Gene on that, but that's not Gene doing Gene. That's Gene trying to do something new and fresh. So, you know, that's what I'm saying. A lot of the, a lot of the, the the licks will cross collateralize themselves but i'm always trying to bring a new approach and like for instance like the in about a month's time from now you know just a little over a month there's i'm i'm involved in a project with bear mccreary if you're familiar with his, his name um a lot of like Bear does a lot of soundtrack works for movies and TV. And like, for instance, he does all the music for The Walking Dead, and he's doing the, uh, he does the Lord of the Rings project, uh, that, that Amazon Prime show. Um, and we worked on the Godzilla King of the Monsters movie together a few years back. And, but Bear is a serious metalhead as well. And, he has written one of the most amazing bodies of work, flat out, that I've ever been involved in. Like, big time. I wanted to hear that. It, it's called, his album is called The Singularity. It's a solo record, and it comes out in a, it comes out on, let's see, May 10th. Go to bearmccreary.com and look up the musicians that are involved in this record. I play drums on every song on the album, and Bear Bear has worked with. We've worked together in um, with Metalocalypse. Bear does a lot of the uh, the scoring for like the, the clock opera and things like that. And you know his team and he did uh, the latest Death Clock movie, The Army of the Doomstar. And um, um, it is some of the best drumming I've ever done, and it's also some of the best music. I've ever been involved in. It's the best produced record I've ever been involved in. I mean, this thing is going to be gargantuan. And like I say, 
the list of players that are involved in this is massive and mighty. You've got from, you know, Serge Tankian to Slash, Joe Satriani, Jens Kidman from Meshuggah, Corey Taylor, uh, Scott Ian, Brendan Small, Lara Christine, she's all over it, um, Kim Thiel from Soundgarden, um, and the list just goes on and on and on. And everybody who's involved elevated their playing to some style, some degree. This album is going to be gargantuan, and it is a very, very heavy record. Very seriously, like like brutal metal, but also so tasty. It runs the gamut, you know. I mean, they're they're they're. There is every kind of style on this record, and it is all really entertaining. And it, it, every song, when that song is over, you're like, wow, what is this next song gonna sound like? Because the first four songs on the record are like this. And at the end of that four song, you're like, what's the next one? I can't wait to hear that. And that's something cool as well. So that's, it's a really, really killer, killer album, man. And I'm, I'm really excited for people to hear it. You might be so. getting the best metal compilation album since Roadrunner United. So, uh, at least, uh, <laughs> so, so. But, right. Gene, I want to thank you so much again for your time today. And I am looking forward Thanks to this well. um, fantastic Death to All uh, show. I live four blocks from Gramercy Theater, so I will most certainly see you there. Yes. So, uh, thank you so much. Everybody, Gene Hoagland of Death to All. We'll see you next time on Heavy New York.